Hi, Tobias. How are you? Hello. I'm good, thank you. How are you? Yeah, no, very well, thank you. Very well. I'm looking forward to having this tasting uh, with yourself and the great range that you've got at Hambledon's Wines. To uh, start the tasting, can you just fill me in on your background? And there's also quite an interesting background about Hambledon itself. Um, go for it. Yeah, definitely. Okay, so I'll sort of start with the the background of Hambledon since it's uh, the most interesting out of the yeah. two, I think. Uh, so Hambledon is actually the oldest commercial vineyard here in the UK. It was uh, planted in 1952 uh, by the then owner, Sir, well, it's actually Major General Sir Guy Salisbury Jones, um, who planted it together with, uh, with help from Paul Roger, actually, the Champagne House, Paul Roger, um, because Sir Guy had been um, a diplomat in Paris, I believe, and, and he was a Francophile. So the story goes that he was standing in his uh, dining room that looks out on this south-facing slope of pure chalk uh, here in, in Hampshire, um, and just thinking what he wanted to do with it. And a son, a son of his uh, just jokingly said that you should plant a vineyard. And, and a year later, he had. Um, so that's how it started in the 50s. And, and it was, I, I'm not 100% I'm not sure how, how big it was. It wasn't extremely large. But by the 60s, they, he hired a, a winemaker. I think it was in 1966. Um, Bill Carpery, who actually still lives here, he, he, he's in his 90s now, and he lives on the estate just down the road, so he, he comes up here quite often to, to talk to us, which is quite nice. Uh, and actually following this, the, 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 the wines drew quite an attention to itself, it was quite a following actually. So they, they were served in sort of the, in, in the Houses of Parliament, uh, in embassies around the world, and I know that at least on one occasion uh, the Queen served it um, in Paris um, to, I think it was uh, Pompidou, who was uh, president <coughs> back then. So it, it, has, it has quite a legacy actually, I haven't done. Yeah. Um, and, and this and sadly, when Sir Guy died in the 80s and the state ch changed hands, so the winemaking aspect sort of fell away. They, always, they, they kept, I think, four acres of vines and they sold, they still produced the fruit, but they sold it to other wineries. Mm -hmm. um, this was by the 90s, basically. And so the modern history of Hambledon you can say starts in 1999 when uh, Ian Kellett uh, buys the estates and he was actually already then interested in in sort of renewing the the winemaking aspects of Hambledon and it took a few years I think in 2005 he planted sort of a 10 acre test bed after having done some sort of, you know, checking the geology and just thinking about the climatological aspects and realizing most importantly that what you should do here is English sparkling wine by the Champagne method. That's, sure. that's what you should do here. So the, the grapes that you should have here are called Chardonnay, Pinot Noir and Meunier. Um, and that's what he planted in, in 05. So the following years, he produced some wines actually, but under another name, it was called Milldown. And it was because he, Ian has always wanted Hambledon to be 100% estate grown and made on site. So he didn't take back the brand name Hambledon until he had built his own winery here, which was in 2011. So this is still this is still a thing. We only only use estate grown fruit for, for Hambledon and we obviously only make it here. But I would say things really came together in 2011 because A, the, the, the winery was built and it's quite an interesting winery. It's the 
only fully gravity, at least it was at the time, I'm not 100% sure how, right now, but um, it's, it was the only fully gravity fed winery in, in the UK. So the grapes come from the very top and then okay. by gravity it goes down different. We have like one, two, three, four stories of winemaking basically. Um, but the other thing that happened in 2011, which is also very, very important for Hamilton, is the appointment of Hervé Gestin, which is, you can say, our head winemaker. Um, Hervé is a very, very renowned chef de cave in Champagne. He led uh, Duval Le Roy from the 80s until 2006, I think, um, taking them from 400,000 bottles a year to basically 6 million bottles a year when he left. Okay. And uh, subsequent, subsequently, he started um, consulting all around the world. So he's consulting in everything from Spain to Francia Corta, even Russia. And funnily enough, how he ended up here is because we have this link to this historical link to Paul Roger. So Ian wanted to reach out to the Pogoger family, which is actually the Debye family. So he reached out to Hubert Debye, just asking for advice. And Hubert recommended Hervé as, uh, as the head winemaker here, um, saying that, that he had once before tried to, to, <laughs> to hire him as the winemaker at Pogoger. And <laughs> it's quite a recommendation to have from Hubert de Bille. Yeah. Um So Ian went for it, and which is, I think, one of the most important aspects here, because Herve is very famous in in our world for minimal intervention winemaking. So um, maybe we can uh, probably talk about more about the technical aspect of the winemaking when we try the wine. Sure. But that is sort of the start. And then did you want to, you also asked how, who I am, what I'm doing here. Yeah, go for it. <laughs> okay. So basically I came here in 2016. So I to be, to explain like winemaking at Hamlet is very much a, a team effort. So we are, we are, three winemakers that are involved in it, uh, even four. And then, so we have one resident winemaker, which is Felix Gabier. And I am here sort of under the guise as an operational winemaker. Um, and then Arve, of course. Uh, but we also have, obviously, every year we have interns from, from winemaking schools that that's help out a lot. So I would say that uh, there's no one person that, that makes Hamden wine. It's very, very, very much a team effort. Okay. Um, I arrived here in 2016 because I had work, I was working in, uh, in Saint-Emilion at the Chateau Lagardière. I just um, finished my enology uh, degree. Um, I studied in, in, uh, in Montpellier and in Bordeaux. And I was, I was working at Chateau Lagardière and as most people, when they finish their masters, they want to do sort of the working over the equator for, for some time to get experience. So already being in, in, in Bordeaux, I, I started working at Chateau Gaffelière. And whilst there, I thought that for, for the next sort of European harvest, I, I would like to go to Champagne and work. And it just so happened that my contact in Champagne was a registrar. And so I contacted Hervé and I asked him if he had anything for me in Champagne. Uh, <laughs> and he said like, yes, maybe, but uh, I would advise you to come with me to, to England instead. So okay. in between in between Bordeaux and here, I was I was in, in New Zealand working at um, a St. Clair family estate for a, a mm. harvest. And then I came here and I, yeah, I, I was just straight away very, very impressed with what was happening here. Um, there is no other place in, in the world, I think, where an industry is growing as it is here, uh, but also that has such a raison d'etre as, as 
as the as English sparkling wine has, because it just mm. makes sense to make this wine here. Sure. So yeah, that's that's how I how I ended up here, basically. Okay, great. No, thank you for, for putting us in there. So down to the tasting. Where would you like to start? So I think that we should start with the classic cuvee because sure. that is the sort of the house blend. So it's 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 the entry level wine, but since it's it's also the most important blend, I would say because yes, as with the champagne house, the standard brut is always the most important. Where you really? that is what most consumers are going to to drink, and that's really where you need to sort of show the house style. I completely agree because a, a lot of I think consumers aren't aware how important a standard cuvee is or a classic cuvee is for a vineyard and winery. And I said this a lot that it, it almost says the most about the brand. It's a really yeah. important wine to get right. Oh yeah, 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 definitely. It's it's um, it's the mo it's also the I mean it's 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 almost the most difficult one to make as well because you want to have a standard quality, but you're also making more in terms of volume um so it's 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 very technically challenging to to make something like that so and i i'm i I, I think that's the one that i drink privately the most probably it's the classic cube actually okay. um, and i know that's the case quite often with, with people from champagne houses as well so you have to like your entry-level wine yeah which as you say is it's um is an entry level it's merely an introduction so this is where we position ourselves. So yes, let's let's go through the wine. So as I as I mentioned, the um, process here is very minimal intervention. So it, it starts off with gravity, basically. That's that's where it starts. It it starts off by we have having our presses. So we have the cocktail presses, the champagne presses. We have one four ton and one eight ton, and we take grapes up by an elevator to the top floor and then the presses are charged manually from there and then the presses sort of stands between two floors and the floor under i often stand with Hervé tasting the juice that, that comes down and the first step that is very interesting uh, for us that i've learned here is that oxygen is not something that should, you should be afraid of in, um, in this okay. case because you often think that often, uh, you often hear, and especially when you work in New Zealand and Australia, that you have to protect the juice from oxygen. Um, that is maybe true if you have a high pH and you're in a warm country, but when you have low pH, such as here, it's actually very important to let the juice get in contact with, with air sort of accustom it to it. So the wine in itself after shouldn't be oxidized, but the juice is actually can be a very you, we, we don't we don't try to protect it much at all. Um, so what we do at the press set we have our classic bellons that, that we, we we follow we follow sort of the champagne style of, of making the wine. So to, we we're not trying to reinvent the wheel. It's it makes no sense. We're, we are making Method traditionnelle wine from the champagne grapes. Champagne is the, clo it's the closest wine region. Yeah. It it's just makes sense to, as a starting point, just follow the champagne guidance. So we follow the rules uh, that is set out in champagne at the press. We can be more severe um, than that, or if if we have the freedom to work differently, but quite often we tend to be more severe than the guidance from champagne that, that they are regulated and you have to get into these uh, things. But, yeah, there's um, a bit more freedom, isn't there? Mm -hmm. There's a bit more freedom for you to explore, so you're not quite so restricted. As oh, well, it's, yeah, if you compare to champagne, there is it's total freedom here. Yeah. It's, it's, it's anarchy. But, uh, <laughs> <okay>. <laughs> anarchy on <But>, winemakers. <laughs> no, no. But we do, we do follow. We, so, so basically, the, the good thing with having Harvey here is, is, is that these type of things. So, the first is the tasting of the juice. It's obviously something you can't learn in school. You can't theoretically learn this. You have to do it. And Harvey has been 
uh, chef de cave since, since the 80s. He, he has, he's in his fifth decade of winemaking now. He, right. I think last harvest was his 74th harvest because he'd done up to five a year with, with consulting. So that is really for us, for Felix and I to be here to learn from that. It's, you, you can't, you just, uh, you can't learn that anywhere. It's, it's, that's fantastic when it comes yeah. to the winemaking here and for us. So at the press, what is important is that you're selecting the different quality. You're fractioning up the different quality of, of the juice. So when the press is loaded, you basically have free run that is just dripping out. This free run, we don't consider qualitative at all for wine at all. This is something that we would send at two, and in the be very beginning, it's just basically washing up the grapes yeah. and it can be a bit diluted if it's being wet outside. We taste and we say, okay, this is not good for wine. Then theoretically, you actually go into what is called the cuvee fraction, but we don't start at cuvee fraction. We have to think that the in the very beginning, this depends on from press to press, but in general, we actually go into the tie fraction. And the tie fraction is something that is normally when you press hardest at the end of the press cycle, you press things from closer to the skin. But the, we want our cuvee to be the absolute best quality of the juice. And that you get, or from the grape, and that you get in the middle of the grape. So it's not until we have finished loading the press, it's closed and we have started, so it's actually started to press that we see a, a change where we can have a higher, both a higher acidity and sugar levels. Okay. Uh, and you, so you feel it. And then we go into cuvee. And then as long as we keep, you have the theoretical sort of champagne guidance of how much you are in champagne allowed to take out as cuvee, and then you have to go into tie. This we don't have to follow, but we, 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 we do. We don't go over a certain press cycle. If we don't have the volume that we've calculated and we are in a, in a sort of harsher press cycle, then we won't take it out in cuvee, we will put it into tie, et cetera, et cetera. And so the difference between these two fractions that you have the cuvee and the tie, it's not necessarily qualitatively as such. I, mean, I think people think of the Thai fraction, which is smaller as a sort of a lesser quality. It's, it's more like a different quality because you are okay. pressing from closer to the skins and it's, it's actually, it's fruitier and less acidic. So you have a fraction that is very, it's, 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 it, it helps a lot when you do the blending and it's something that gives sort of, it gives shoulders to the wine and it gives a directness in the fruit to the wine. So bringing it back to the classic. So this is something for an entry level. And this, I think is the same in champagne everywhere. So in an entry level, like the classic cuvee, you would have, you will work more with the tie when it comes to the blending, because you want to have, you want it to be sort of a wine that you can, that most people can enjoy of as course. soon as you buy it. You don't have to wait for it. So, so the time fraction is quite important for something <clears throat> as a classic cuvee, even if it's not a big, the time fraction is much smaller than the, the, the cuvee. So you, it's not like we have a massive <laughs> time fraction in, in the, in the blend of the classic cuvee, but it, it's something that is important here. So the next step in, in our, in, in, in our winemaking is that we let everything take its time. And that's something that is very important for us here. So. There's, there's the two things that sort of, I think might make it stand out here is that we're not afraid of oxygen when it comes to the juice okay. and we let things take time. So we don't co-inoculate. Um, we don't, we don't co-inoculate with, um, with the malolactic bacteria at the same time as the fermentation. We do a slow fermentation and then we let the malolactic we inoculate for the malolactic to be sure that we have full mallow because we want to have full mallow and we let this take all, all winter. So right now in the winery, um, we are very far from being at uh, blending or bottling. You know, we are in the middle of, of malolactic fermentation at the moment. So it's we let it take its time. And 
our barrel fraction then, since it takes time, we, we can do more, perform more batonnage on the barrels. So every week we do batonnage on all the barrels. And the reason why we do this and why we leave the wine longer on the lease is what, because we want to build the mid palate of the base yeah. wine. This is something we want to have. We don't want to have like a half ready wine or like a, a half made wine that we bottle early in like January, February, and then we build it in, in, in bottle after with second fermentation. We build our base wine and then we blend and bottle. So I think when you drink, when you drink the wine, I, I really feel like it's in the, the difference is in the mid palate that we fill out the <clears throat> mid palate by working with the, the matière in French, the working with the lease. And, and letting both the, the tanks and the barrels be on the lease until maybe end of March. Okay. Um, something. So, so it's adding a good bit of texture then. Mm. We've tried previous years with racking, so racking the wine off the lease earlier. Um, and it's almost like the wine is a bit hollow then if you compare mm -hmm. to when you leave it on the, on the lease for longer. Yeah. You really build, you let the wine build and you let it come to place. And since we then, in the end of March, it's, we have sort of a, a base wine that is more sort of full. <laughs> we, uh, then we do the racking and after that we, can, we do the, the assemblage. So the blending. Sure. So the so blending usually happens after Easter, basically. Um, and then Harvey comes here and we sit down. It's Felix, uh, Ian and uh, Harvey and myself. And we do the blending for it takes quite a few days. It's a lot to, to taste. Yeah, of course. Um, because we also have contract winemaking. So we, but we do everything late. Um, but yeah, it's in just in keeping it with the classic, I think, but just this technical explanation is something that goes for all wines that it's, it's important for us that it's gravity fed, it's minimal intervention. It, we let things take its time. So where this is sort of then extended, of course, after the bottling, because we also want the bottle aging to be quite significant. Yeah. So for the classic, this one, this one that you have right now, I mean, we, we're officially, these ones are a minimum of 35 months. So they are always minimum three years, which is where we want it to be. Um, I think the one that you have has been longer on the lease, maybe a, a full year longer than that wouldn't surprise me. Um, and this is, of course, again, to build, to build the wine. I mean, the autolytic effect, you don't really see it until after 18 months. So if you want an autolytic wine, you have to have it for at least 24 months. And if you want to have a serious autolytic effect, well, I think it's around the three years that you, you start seeing that. Um, that then, when we do the, the um, disgorging of the, we, of course, we add a dosage. And since we have worked so much with the base wine, and since we have let the wine age sur lat in Bordeaux, we sort of end up with lower dosages than, than uh, one might think that, that we would have considering the acidity that we get here in England. So this particular one has 4.5 grams per litre, which is, of course, a, not a lot of sugar if you consider that this is a brew. It's almost an extra brew, actually. Um, it's not something that we that we are trying to achieve. It's not something that we 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 always every time we release a new batch of classic cuvee, we do a dosage tasting and we try with an open mind. If we yeah. would think that eight grams per liter was better for the next batch, then we would put it at eight grams per liter. It's, we, we don't, we don't sort of focus on having, because it's, it is more modern, of course, to have lower dosage, but I feel like that we, we just try to find the balance for every individual batch. And 
with this particular wine, it happened to be a 4.5 grams per litre. It's an interesting uh, comment, that balance, because it does come up a lot within winemaking. And it's normally relatively easy to pick out whether a wine is unbalanced, even a somebody who's not a professional taster you know you can tell if the fruit content is off or there's something about the wine that just doesn't sit right like the acidity could be too strong definitely don't get that with this you know and, and, and again i think anybody who is into wine would be able to pick out how smooth it is it's very subtle and i like that i like it when and again it goes back to balance that's what it is so it appears to be subtle purely because you haven't got anything out of kink with itself very very smooth lovely mouthfeel and it's, you know, for a, a standard cuvee, you can tell that the work has gone in and particularly hearing you speak, you're obviously explaining that and it's very, very smooth, or, um, very enjoyable. I think, you know, in a nutshell, you just say it's very enjoyable, but it, it's the balance, I think, that makes this wine. I'm glad, I'm glad to hear it. And actually, it's something that brings me on something that I haven't talked about yet, because of the, one of maybe the main interest of having Hervé Gestin here is the blending. Because, yeah. of course, as you, all of our wines are, at the moment at least, we're going to, in the future, we will release vintage wine. But all of the ones that we have now are non-vintage. And that's something that, for us, it has been important that we feel like before you produce vintage wines, you have to have your non-vintage. Yeah. Because I feel we're, we're, we're trying to, to press the terroir here. And I think it's just an interesting aspect with when you make non-vintage wine. It's the sort of you, there's this saying that, that terroir wine should be a representation of a uh, place in time, but when you make a non-vintage one, you sort of have this aspect of it being a timeless representation of a place, because mm. the longer you work in a certain uh, with, with a vineyard, the more reserve wine you will have. Yeah. So we, we are working with the Solera system, so we've started years ago, which means basically that we take out the same amount of reserve wine as we put in every year. So it's blended, 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 blended every year, which makes this timeless sort of wine that it's just a blend of all previous years. Yeah. And that is something that it's a quite an interesting aspect and that in a climate such as in the English one, since I came here, there hasn't been a year that resembles the other. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> we've had years such as... <laughs> 2018 was absolutely fantastic. And then we had 2019 that was a, it's a horror show when it comes to weather. And then it's it just, it's so variable. And so for us, we feel like, especially for, for these, so the house style, we show a house style better by making a non-vintage because yeah. we can balance them. If we, if we would see that we have a lower quality one year where we don't bottle that as a year and say, yeah, that's the year it's, it's lower quality we are then able to blend in more reserve wine to make it, to keep it at the quality that we want. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's very interesting for us. And, and, and this, of course, is also something that you cannot learn in school. It's just impossible to learn blending. It's very easy to blend. Um, it's very easy to blend red or, or white wine. Uh, it's it, because you, you blend, when you blend just before you are, are releasing something, you just blend and say, oh, I like this is this is what I like. And then you can sell it. But when you blend to make a non-vintage sparkling wine, you're blending for the future. So you have to think you, you it shouldn't taste like something that you want to drink right now. It should taste like something that you want to drink after a second fermentation and after at least three years of bottle aging. And that, that's really something that, again, Hervé's experience is, is just invaluable. You can't put a price on it here because he has in, in himself then, of course, learned from another chef de cab in, that he worked under in the 80s. So it's something that is a, a tradition that is sort of being carried um, through. And that's, that's good. So for us, it's good to, to be able to be linked a bit to, to champagne like that oh. because well, again, we don't want to reinvent the wheel. I mean, they, they've done sparkly wine for hundreds of years over there. So 
I think that you, you should sort of, it's, it's good to, to be able to tap in a bit on, on that knowledge that is there. Absolutely. Um, I mean, it's important to uh, take a lot of that into consideration because as you're saying, he's um, learned all of that from Champagne, from working that and bringing it to working with English sparkling wine is vital. And so you can then draw on that knowledge and wine is a constantly evolving process and it is about the input. It's about many generations, it's about experience and you know what you're talking about relates to that. And that is wine, that is sparkling wine that we're now trying. And I, you know, I completely agree with what you're saying. And I think that's what's so important about wine is you don't have to know the uh, absolute minutiae of everything of this particular vineyard, no. but it's just the enjoyment of it. And people will pick that out. You know, you don't have to be an expert just to go, that has a beautiful texture in my mouth. You can, you know, you really can zone in on it. But in terms of a consumer value, they will pick up on what you're talking about, but they just won't necessarily be able to articulate it. So it's, yeah, it's that's, very that's, important. That's what we that's what we hope, and I mean that's I mean it's exactly what we, we believe as well. Um, well, I'm I'm I think I'm spending a lot of time on this first wine. Do you want yes, to move on to the, on. the rose? <laughs> 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 but so basically, we don't as with with the dosage when when it comes to blending, we don't have we don't we don't have any. I could say that okay, the classic. That we just tried now has 56% Chardonnay, 27% Pinot Noir, and 70% sure. Pinot Meunier, and then 20% uh, reserve wine. It doesn't it doesn't mean that much because it's not something. It's it will be different every year. But that's just what it ended up being. We it, it, again every time we do we know the house style and what Herve really helps us to achieve is to just look at the wine and taste all the different tanks, all the barrels, and manage to recreate that again. And sometimes, some years that, that requires more Pinot Noir, sometimes that requires yeah. less Chardonnay, sometimes that requires more oak, sometimes less oak, sometimes more reserve wine, etc., etc. But that's something that changes every year. So I think it's quite easy to, to just when you look at sort of these technical sheets that you you go into and you think that this is this is sort of the blend of the wine that is this is how we do it it's it's always it's always different to achieve the the same quality that that we want or the, the style that we want. Yes, of course um, so, but in having said that mm. the the rosé that we're going to try yes the the only one, yeah so the classic cuba rosé is basically the only one where we almost have a recipe. <laughs> this rosé in the classic range is a style of one that is called rosé d'assemblage, which means that it's blended. The color comes by blending. So we make a uh, red wine each year, uh, a Pinot Noir, that we then use as a color coloring component in 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 these type of rosés um, which is the traditional way of making a rosé in in champagne and this basically gives us a recipe that is is that harvey has been working with at duval he's been very successful with his rosés around the world and it's 90, it's almost always 90% Chardonnay and ten, around 10, 10-ish percent of this red wine. That's what, what makes this wine. And then of course it can change a bit if we need barrel components, reserve wine, etc. But it's that sort of a recipe that we, that we always have. Sure. And this one, <laughs> it's, it's quite interesting because now, now this one has, I think, minimum 45 months on on the lease and i think okay. i would say something that will sound very weird now but i think that actually this is something that we will work on having less time on lease um because i think that uh, a classic a rosy in this in the classic range it, it, it would probably only need around 24 months for to have this balance of when you need you want a pretty fruit yeah um, but you want the creaminess of the of the autolysis, yeah. but 
maybe you don't need all of the this autolytic aromas that we have now. That's uh, that's something to, if, if, that we we are sort of working with changing in uh, in the future. But it depends. It depends on like how fast these cells are, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Sure, but sure. that's just something. If that that uh, to say, I, it's it's of course. It's fantastic to have a rose at this price point that has a minimum of forty-five months on on the lease. But um, when when it, when it comes to the to the other classic, we we feel like it really needs it should have a minimum of of three years. But a rose like this doesn't necessarily need all that time on the lease. Right. So it's a different style of wine. I mean, what as you say, going back to different style, I think it's very important for still rosé, a sparkling rosé, to have a bit of an edge to it. And I don't mean as an, a, like a, a biting element, but it, it needs definition. Perhaps that's a better word for it, because that does come from the freshness. And you want a rosé to be able to cut through, uh, and a sparkling rosé, to cut to cut through certain textures that you will a- appreciate. And so, like this is great for food. And in order for that to be paired well, you need that edge. It has to have the texture. It's a, it's a, it's a definition to a wine. It's very, very important because you, you, you can't go, again, particularly with roses, you can't go one way or the other. You know, if it's a bit too sweet, too sickly, or there's not enough there, not enough acidity to counteract it. So it's a wine that really needs balance. Um, but when it's yeah. off, when it's achieved, it's just so versatile you know, on its own with food, different environments. It's, uh, yeah. it's, um, it's great. And particularly talking about this wine, the, uh, um, the immediate elements that I noticed was the balance again going back to what you're mm. saying and hearing what you talk it's very notable straight away on, on the palate so i'll let you uh, talk us through through the wine then itself yeah so yeah no it's great i'm thank you for those comments i am very happy to to, to hear no, it's something that is worth noting on on rosy like this is that generally in our wines we have very low dosage we, we, 4.5 is it's, uh, in, the, in the classic. This one is almost always ends up around 10 grams liter, which is quite a traditional uh, dosage when it comes to champagne, I would say. But this is this is really tight. We don't we we don't have any bias against sugar in that sense. We we just we're looking for that balance that you're talking about. And, exactly. and when it comes to balance in the road say like this we, we we really want to lift the the, the prettier sort of wild strawberry aromas there and and sugar can really lift these elements and especially so for us the liqueur that we use for, for the dosage it's it's very important we make the so we use what is called the mise en sacre, which it means that we use the, the this wine to make the liqueur that we're going to use so we basically a liqueur is ba- like this is basically 50% sugar and 50% wine. So this is something that you can reduce your costs in significantly, but you can buy already made stuff that that you can add, or you can have uh, make a you can make just a, a liqueur tank some some wine that you blend with the sugar. But we actually use the exact wine. So we open up bottles of the wine that has been all this time on the lease. Okay. And make the liquor, and this is also quite something that that it makes a big difference. We've we've done tastings here where we try we we just try what it would taste like if we would do a more generalized liqueur that would be cheaper for us. And it just the balance just it's not the same. We taste the difference, um, and even even just using classic cuvee for the basis of the liquor of the premier cuvee it's it's just it doesn't it doesn't match so we use for the classic cuvee we use that specific specific classic cuvee release same for the rose the same for the premier um and it, it's really of course noticeable when you have a wine such as the rose where you have a higher dosage that it yeah. makes it even more more important um what else can i say about the rose i think ma'am <laughs> It's um, yeah. The, the 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 balance is something that is, and the and the textures. That's something that we Definitely. always are looking for. And 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 again, that's that's something balance you achieve by letting things take its time, 
but also that's something that you achieve just by it's, it's by tasting. You can't be too technical and decide stuff in front of a computer in a lab. That's not you. You have to taste. <laughs> that's that's yeah. how you end up. And you, you with and you can't decide beforehand how how it's, things should be blended. What dosage you should have. This this is something that that needs to be decided for every batch. That's definitely Remind me, what's the the age on this? Because it's still very fresh. That's what I'm picking up on. But there's a yeah. Little, so it's a text. minimum of forty five months on uh, so that so on the lease in bottle. So it's, okay, uh, that's quite a substantial amount of time then. Wow. Yeah, it's a very substantial, especially for um. I mean, it's it's uh, it's mainly from the 2015 harvest this one, uh, and the classic before that was was mainly from the the base is the 2016. Okay. Well, I'm. I'm yeah, very, so we, sorry, go on. No, no, it's just saying, so basically this is a, we at at the moment. I think that's something that we will continue with as well. We have two ranges. So we have the classic range, and then we have the premier range. 